Hi, I'm Tony Cortese. I'm the other principal of the Intentional Endowments Network. And uh, I'm here to welcome you, but I don't have to say anything because after what President Rooney said, it's all been said. Um, I will, in a, on a serious vein, uh, talk a little bit about why we are here. Um, and you gave us a really terrific explanation of the role of higher education. Because if it weren't for higher education, we would not have the modern society that we have today. And the, the role of higher education is to maintain, renew, and evolve society in a positive direction. That's why we exist. And we've been given the opportunity to have tax-free status and to, uh, and to actually accumulate um, funds you know, from the private sector, from individuals, and from government and foundations in order to, to produce the leadership and the knowledge that will result in a thriving civil and sustainable society. Uh, and it's none too soon to be, be doing that because, you know, I might ask myself, uh, why are we here? Why are we here right now? Well, it's very interesting because humanity is at a crossroads without historical precedent. Because of the extraordinary and exponential growth of population and expansive dynamic of industrial capitalism, humans have become a planetary force comparable in disruptive power to the ice ages and the asteroid collisions that previously redirected Earth's history. Despite all the work society has done on environmental protection, all living systems are in long-term decline and are declining at an increasing rate. We are severely disrupting the stability of the climate and the Earth's ecosystems which made human progress to date possible. While the Earth's population has grown from 1 billion to 7.4 billion in the last two centuries, energy consumption has gone up 80 times and economic output has gone up 68 times. And the majority of that has occurred in my lifetime. Sustainability challenges related to climate disruption, water, food, ec economic inequality, poverty, and social unrest pose an existential threat to society. There are nearly three billion people without sanitation uh, and make less than $2.50 a day. Over a billion lack an adequate supply of drinking water and make less than $2.50 a day. This is happening with 30% of the world's population consuming about 70 to 80% of the world's resources, and we are on track to have 3 billion new middle-class consumers in society by 2030. That's where we're going to go. So the question really is, it's not about the environment, frankly. It's really about how do we create a decent quality of life for all current and future humans on a planet where the capacity to support life is precarious. In a way, you know, when we use the word sustainability, a lot of people think it's just about the environment, and it's not. It's about sustainability of human civilization. I got my doctorate in public health because I was focusing on how contamination of the environment would affect people's health in a negative way. And it's all about how do we have a harmonious relationship with the natural world so that everybody on the planet can have a decent quality of life. So the urgency of moving society on, on a healthy, just, and sustainable path is there. And the challenge is business as usual will not work. That's why we're here talking about investments. That's why we have now uh, a number of colleges and universities that have been moving in different ways. We need a transformative shift in the way we think, act, both individually and collectively. We have to lead in higher education. Why? Because we have the role of providing the knowledge and the educated citizenry for a thriving civil society. We are also the only sector that is capable of creating the broad scale and necessary change in mindset uh, in order to move society in this direction. The skills, the values of professionals, that's why we exist. Without that, we can't succeed. And we need to be a model, uh, of, uh, a model for higher education. Why? Because students learn from everything they do, everything they see, everyone they interact with. And it's not enough to just learn it in the classroom. It has to be part of the full experience. 
And this is about, uh, is not only about us now, but it's about future generations. So how did IEN get started? Uh, what, you know, why are we here as a network? Well, it stems from two efforts. Second Nature, an organization I had the privilege to found and lead, has been working to transform the education, research, operations, and community service of higher education for over two decades. In this work, we led the development and implementation of the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, a publicly transparent and accountable commitment by now over 650 colleges and universities in all 50 states and the District of Columbia to do what is scientifically necessary and become carbon neutral in their operations and prepare students to help the rest of society do the same. And I'm pleased to say that Loyola University is one of the signatories and is on track to become carbon neutral by 2025, which is very, very impressive and, er, and critical. And I want to introduce my good friend and colleague, uh, Tim Carter. Stand up, Tim, you have to stand up. Uh, he's, the, he's now the president of Second Nature, uh, and uh, we're pleased to have him here uh, and uh, help us move on. But despite this progress and the explosion of new educational and operational initiatives, most of these schools and other schools have not focused on the health, social, or environmental impacts of their investments and whether the investments support their mission. You know, in some ways, it's like a lead wall between the endowments and everything else the colleges and universities were doing. And now that's changing. When the student fossil fuel divestment movement hit, many colleges and universities were uncertain on how to deal with the pressure and how to examine the larger set of issues related to the impact of their investments. All investments have an impact. We hope they're positive for society, but they all have an impact. And so what we need to do is try to figure out how you make that impact as positive as possible for as many people as possible and the rest of nature. So there were all, many of them were dealing with these issues individually. So in 2014, Jonathan Lash, who was the president of Hampshire College and was the head of the World Resources Institute, called me up and said, Tony, we, we're getting calls from colleges and universities all over the place trying to figure out how to deal with the fossil fuel divestment and how to think about uh, socially responsible investing. And he said, what do you think about actually holding a conference to help schools try to figure this out? And I said, we're, we're on. And uh, we, uh, after that initial conference where we brought together many of the people that are in this room, uh, we consulted with about 200 leaders across the country in, in, in academia, uh, in foundations, invest, in the investment industry, and we decided to form the, intentionally, the Intentional Design, in, Intentional Endowments Network. Why did we do this? Well, what are we trying to accomplish? We want people to be intentional about having their endowments, enhance their final financial performance, are aligned with their institution and values, and their mission, and to contribute to creating a sustainable society, helping to move capital formation in a direction that will benefit everybody, not just the owners of capital. And that critical need led to the formation of, of this uh, in June of 2014. We are a broad-based collaborative network uh, that is advancing intentionally designed endowments through a variety of strategies for integration of environmental, social, and governance criteria, impact investing, shareholder engagement. Our approach is to support endowments to learn from and collaborate with each other in finding the solutions that work for you at your own pace and in accordance with your own institutional culture. We do not push any particular kind of, of investment strategy. We're agnostic as to the type of strategies. We're not pushing divestment of fossil fuels. We're not anti-divestment of fossil fuels. We're about trying to help people figure out how to do really good investing that looks at all of the potential impact. To do this, we work with and we build on and promote, celebrate, and expand on the existing efforts. We're, we created a network because we want to get scale. We want synergy and scale and that's why we, are, uh, we created a network where we connect all of the different groups that are trying to work on these issues together. So I will close with just a couple of uh, quick thoughts. 
We think this is about better investing. Pure and simple. It's about really prudent, good investing that is actually going to work for everybody in the long term. And we think it's also about the ownership of capital and helping to move capital formation in a direction that's going to benefit all of society. We know that all of this is complicated. We know that there are many stakeholders. We know that there are no quick fixes. But what we're here about over the next two days is to help you work and share and collaborate with each other so that you can find solutions that works uh, as well, as good as possible for you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Tony. And thank you, President Rooney, Eric Jones, uh, Aaron Dernbaugh, uh, Rob Munts, and everyone here at Loyola for hosting us and making this event possible. And thanks to all of you for coming. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us in this conversation. Um, I'm just going to quickly uh, set a little bit of the context and give a little bit of background, more background about this network and how it came together and why, um, just as to set the stage a little bit for Barbara, who's then going to get us into conversation and, and tell you a little bit about how this meeting is going to run over the next couple of days. So as Tony mentioned, it, coming out of that first event, we saw this real need for a network. And it's really about connecting all of you with each other, with, with peers from other schools, with investment managers and consultants who are working on these issues. Um, we work to pull together the best resources we can find, create them, working with people in the network where, where, where it's needed, um, and having meetings like this to get people together to move the conversation forward. Uh, last summer, we formed a steering committee that sort of serves as the core of this network. I don't expect you to read all those names, but trust me, there's some wonderful people, um, about half of which are actually here. Could I just ask our steering committee members that were able to make it to stand up and give people a sense of, of where you are in the room? And our deep thanks to all the work that you've been doing on this network. And so that, that large group, as I said, has helped set the strategic um, sort of frame for a lot of the work the network does. Earlier this year, we uh, formed a smaller group, a subgroup of that committee the exec to create an executive committee. Um, and we got six out of these eight members are here. So um, again, I hope you'll connect with them. And um, they're really helping us to prioritize and you know, meeting more frequently and working with more of the implementation of some of the activities in the network. Um, a big part of that, in addition to these events, um, is a series of working groups on specific issues that are kind of the, the prime issues that keep coming up in these conversations, things like financial performance and fiduciary duty and how these concepts of sustainable investing or ESG investing that we'll be talking about over the next couple of days um, perform and fit into that context. Um, whoops. These are just the charges of each of those working groups. Again, I don't uh, expect you to read these, but all these presentations will be available after, and this information is all on our website. Um, so we encourage you to check it out and, and find opportunities to engage more deeply. Um, these working groups have been developing resources, briefing papers, white papers on these specific topics to help um, get their thinking and what they've, um, this, you know, the conclusions that they're coming to on these issues out to a broader audience. Again, this is all available on our website. And we've held a series of webinars, again, to keep these conversations going online um, in between the times when we're able to meet in person. Um, our online resource center, as I said, we've tried to pull together the best reports from uh, you know, others in the field that are out there and just kind of make it easy for folks to get up the learning curve on these issues so you don't have to go chase down a lot of these reports and you know, kind of organize by topic. And one of the biggest things that we've gotten positive feedback from the network is around a weekly news update that we send around that's just sort of the head headlines and quick summaries about um, news in this space, what's happening on campuses with regard to sustainable investment or sustainability more generally. Um, and other relevant developments in the field. Uh, these forums, as I said, have been a big part of it. Uh, that first one that Tony mentioned that we partnered with Hampshire College on two and a half years ago now, this will be our seventh major forum, and we've held several other smaller meetings and events. Uh, and through those, the kind of growth of the network has really happened organically. And you can see here just the individuals that have engaged in some way, shape, or form. Um, so all that's just to give you a little bit more context about what we're trying to do with the network. This is a conversation that's been happening, and we really hope that you will engage beyond these two days um, and provide us with your feedback on what will be most useful for you for the network to focus on. Um, and yeah, we really look forward to your thoughts on that. And with that, I will hand it over to Barb, our facilitator and meeting designer, who is going to get us right into conversation, which is really what this is all about. We're going to have a good time together the next two days. My job is to make sure that we stay on time and on task 
and that the questions that you want to get answered, and there it goes. We're, we're having, yeah. it's going to be fun, but I'm loud enough, right? You can hear me? Yeah. All right, so there, there's questions that we know you want to engage on, and you want to walk out of here taking actions. And my job is to make sure that you get what you want out of this meeting. Um, another way to describe it is some people say I become a pushy broad, but that's the job, okay? <laughs> so just a quick story about me, and it's relevant to this meeting and what we're trying to do here. About four years ago, I was minding my business about to have dinner in my kitchen. And our minister, who at one point in life was um, the CFO of Genzyme, he was a Harvard MBA, interesting minister. I come for dinner, and with him was the other Why you're all still outside with these gremlins in this room. <laughs> Can you hear me back there? Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll keep going. So the minister at the table had been a CFO. Um, the husband was at the table, and he, uh, Charles, you'll get to meet him later. Charles spent his life as an SRI professional and fixed income. And the son was at the table. And the son was one of those kids who was probably sitting outside the university president's door wanting him to digest. He was an activist. And up comes the topic of divestment. The minister says, absolutely not. And the kid says, absolutely. And the husband says, well, it depends. I said, wow, that's interesting. So we had another conversation where we brought about 12 people into the living room this time who came from all different professions. And we started talking about divestment. People thought, you know, it's a really good idea. Maybe we can do something good about it. But nobody knew what it really was. Nobody really understood it. We had more questions than we had answers. And the Unitarian Church was about to have a big fight with each other over this issue. So we decided we would have a third meeting. And my good friend Tim Smith was one of the people who volunteered to be part of this forum. We got a whole bunch of folks who knew about it. And we wound up filling the entire church in Boston. It was called To the Best or Not To the Best. And we put it up on YouTube afterwards. And it started, and it's going to seem very familiar to you as we go through this meeting. It started with a panel of folks who were all <coughs> knew what the first question was that I was going to ask them. Because it was the questions we found in that little focus group I had in my house. We know what people didn't know. So we started a conversation to get people on common ground. Then there was a conversation back and forth between the panelists where they kind of went a little deeper. Then we turned it over to the audience and we let them ask a lot of questions. That was the format. That's the format you're going to see us using lots of times here in the room. Except at the end of it, you're going to have conversations at your tables. So anybody who doesn't want to ask a question in the big room, you can ask it at the table quietly. What happened as a result of that is that video got seen and discussed at Unitarian churches all over the country. And about a year and a half later, when they had to take a vote of whether or not to divest, they decided that yes, they would divest, but our investment managers could buy any stock they wanted for the purpose of shareholder activism. Because they deliberated and learned together, just like we're doing, other strategies emerged. There wasn't one to answer. And so we learned and grew. The other piece is we work with people real questions to help people come to their own real action. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing. <coughs> all right, so kind of, that's how I got involved in all of this. I made the mistake of sending an email to Tony when I heard about that he was doing these meetings, saying you can watch the tape, and by the way, I'm running meetings, and we've been off the running ever since. So let me show you what the questions were that you asked, and how this meeting will be organized as a conversation to help you get answers to your questions, and how we're going to put them in videotape and on our website, so just like those other folks, you can bring them back to your campuses and your institutions and engage other people in the conversation. Ready? Yes. Okay.